In 2006, it established the successor of the former Commission on Human Rights. You know that it, has been, it had been very criticized for different reasons and uh, was then only a subsidiary body of the UN Economic and Social Council. But it has become, in 2006, a, um, a, a, um, a subsidiary body of the General Assembly, also reducing its members were 53 states, and now they are 47 member states as part of the uh, Commission on uh, the Council of uh, Human Rights. The International Court of Justice, based in The Hague, adjudicates disputes among states, replacing the Permanent Court of International Justice, as it was named before. So the International Criminal Court was added and became functional in two, that's the ICC, we, could, we call it, uh, in 2002 to try crimes under international law, including war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. It's an independent court, but it is financed by the UN. Its predecessors are um, still active, the ICCY and the ICCR, were specifically created for trying crimes from Yugoslavia and Rwanda. And I think there's maybe Somalia now added to, to this one. So this year marks the 60th anniversary of the adoption and proclamation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations on de in December 1948. So we can celebrate this incredible profession of faith in fundamental rights. And I quote from the Universal Declaration, in the dignity and worth of the human person and in the equal rights of men and women, and the goal, end of the quotation, and the goal of member states, and I quote again, to achieve the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms as it's, uh, end of the quote, as it states in its preamble. The Universal Declaration is a set of principles, a set of ideals to which member states agreed to adhere to and guarantee those fundamental rights to the people of their respective countries under their jurisdiction. It contains, in addition to the preamble, 30 articles which state in very clear and comprehensive language the obligations that states have undertaken. But I'm just um, going to, to quote a few articles. Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. This is exactly what, art what Article 7 of the Canadian Charter says. Article 5, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Article 7, all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. All are entitled to equal protection against any discrimination in violation of this declaration and against any incitement to such discrimination. So I quoted three of those. So the International Bill of Human Rights, which since 1976 formed part of the international law, consists of, in addition to the Universal Declaration, the International Covenant of Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, adopted in 1976 by the General Assembly, plus two of its optional protocols. This is the body that forms international law. We need a culture of respect a culture of human rights, instead of a culture of hate, a culture of love rather than a culture of guns. But by, mobilizing a, uh, by the mobilization of a constituency of conscience, the tragedies that come to define our time can be prevented if we really believe in the dignity of man. Yeah. Speaking now of my pet project, my pet... Um, um, Subject, equality. I couldn't do anything without talking about it. It's so fundamental. Um, it's simply apparent that there is a fundamental link between human rights and equality, the right to equality being itself a fundamental right. From, Im from time immemorial, human beings have thirsted for justice. Our pursuit of this ideal 
has necessarily translated into a long and difficult search for truth, impartiality, and ultimately, equality. So, equality is important to all of us because of our deep-seated justice for, uh, uh, desire for justice. Inequality is injustice by itself. And from inequality and injustice, it flows oppression. And from uh, an inequality fosters hate, social unrest, wars, revolution, as well as many other ills in social, societal, as well, as well as private relationships. So, um, equality um, uh, has developed through uh, a number of decennies and, and centuries. Aristotle, for example, spoke of equality in terms of proportionality. Equal should be treated equally, but unequal should be treated in proportion of their inequalities. It's uh, separate but equal, so the, the doctrine. But that was Aristotle. And uh, uh, this approach, of course, begs the questions. Equals or unequals in what? Aristotle distinguished between persons of free and noble birth and the slaves, uh, or in the indentured servants. He advocated for equality according to merit, but what he deemed merit would not be acceptable today. We no, no longer speak of inequals uh, or of merit. Instead, most of us do recognize that true equality is an ideal. We see that Aristotle's approach and similar approaches have served only to perpetuate inequalities and reinforce this disempowerment. Egalitarianism, the next step in the development of equality principle, began with the Reformation, with Luther. He complained that differences or inequalities among human beings were arbitrary and unacceptable. They are the product, he said, of the existing hierarchy within the church, and it was only later that his ideas inspired discussion as to, the legal and polit as to legal and political equality. The Reformation's notion of equality was no more refined than Aristotle's, for equality in the Reformation tolerated inequalities. But in the mid-18th century, John Locke pursued the ideal further. Locke brought egalitarianism from the realm, realm of the spiritual to forums that, that were both political and ideological. Locke's thesis was that each individual is equally entitled to freedom. Our equality flows according to him, from the idea that no individual may be subjected to the will or authority of another person. In this sense, Locke constructed the universal and equal right to be free from straight intrusion. This, in turn, is said to have inspired the American Declaration of Independence. Yet, make no mistake, the 18th century notion of equality was severely limited Slaves and women were not included, and equal rights were severely limited. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the late 18th century continental philosopher, had a very different view of equality. Rousseau's social contract rejected egalitarianism, emphasizing instead the common good. According to Rousseau, human beings are naturally equal. We create governments by social contract in order to correct inequalities caused by the ills of civilization. For Rousseau, the only legitimate form of government is a government of the people. It's no wonder that at the time Rousseau's work was banned in France, probably excommunicated, nor is it a surprise that this, his thesis inspired a revolution and the cry, of course, liberty, equality, and fraternity. John Stuart Mill and later Immanuel Kant and Simone de Beauvoir pursued this interrelationship between individual human dignity and the good of the community. They brought a more humanitarian vision and emphasized that equality is about dignity and respect. So I'm talking about Mill and Kant and Simone de Beauvoir. They brought a more humanitarian vision and emphasized that equality is about dignity and respect. It is these late thinkers who gave rise to human rights and the notion that human beings should only be free from intrusive state 
not only be free from intrusive states, but they must also be free from discrimination. Um, so uh, this is one of the principles at the base and of uh, human rights. Now, equality around the world, while equality has taken a different meaning over the centuries I just explained, it has matured as societies we live in become more conscious and self-aware. Indeed, the notion of equality is con constantly being recast as we become increasingly cognizant that the constituent elements of society do not conform to the white male-dominated values and power structures. Speaking the language of equality will ensure justice for all and a better world for all. I leave you with this phrase from a great American judge. Equality is a miracle and justice is a heaven. We can seek every day, all the time, from each of us. This is a great human rights guy, Leon Higginbotham, the, in open letter to Arthur Littman in 1988 in the Law Review. So I think uh, this, I can't do better leaving you with this quotation. Thank you very much. Once somebody said, poverty is itself a great violence. You know, we talk about violence and we forget poverty itself is a violence and uh, it's spread throughout the world. If we ignore that, we cannot achieve equality and justice. Well, I can give you some break of hope. Uh, the fact that these conventions have uh, been signed and ratified and uh, um, it has, uh, uh, not everything can be achieved in one day, but the fact that, uh, that this is within the radar of, of, of countries. In South Africa, for example, the Constitutional Court ordered the government to give, I think it's electricity or I think it's uh, some, something to, uh, uh, to uh, permit them to live better. Because, because of these conventions, you see, it's percolating through um, the, the system slowly, too slowly. Poverty is not the, uh, I'm the first to say that uh, uh, to have so many billion people uh, in poverty and uh, missing the essential thing for life, because we are guaranteed in, the, in these uh, documents the right to life, what it means, at least a roof and uh, something to eat, it's, it's awful in this day and age. But the idea is that, which is a way of hope. And then, in some countries, uh, they, they are uh, trying to implement, uh, implement, incrementally implement. That was the case of South Africa in one of those decisions. I don't remember the name, but it was one of them. And they said, uh, uh, we cannot order the government to give uh, every, everybody everything. At the moment, we don't have the money. South Africa, particularly after the um, after the apartheid, and so, but they ordered the government to do, to do a step forward to help people. I think it was electricity, but uh, or water, something like that. So it's true that it's it's a, it's a sad uh, constatation to see that um, there's so many people with all those ideals who cannot even enjoy the basis of life. We are all here to, to deplore it and we are human rights people in order to try to achieve a much better um, world. But it's true, we have to say uh, that uh, it's still an ideal in many, many countries. So. Yes, we still. <laughs> Thank you. When we speak of uh, human rights, um, we speak of human rights as universal, inalienable, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I think that there's something implicit within, you know, the notion of inalienable human rights in that they are also ahistorical. They've always existed. That civil rights, you know, uh, are comprised of basically civil and political rights. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there's also that aspect of like social and economic rights. Mm -hmm. And what we see is, you know, with this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that it was actually a product of war, negotiation, mm -hmm. and really a product of almost a Cold War as well, you could say, um, with social and economic rights on one side, civil and political rights on the other side. Mm -hmm. The argument further to that is that social and ec certain forms of economic rights 
are incompatible with capitalist economies. I don't have a crystal justice. ball. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I just, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hopeful as well, but I just can't see how we could possibly have, like, a realization of, you know, uh, social and economic rights as well in, mm -hmm. in the types of societies it that we're we we organized in. They are not guaranteed by the Charter of Rights. No, absolutely Canada. not. No. Definitely. Um, eventually, uh, there was a decision in Gosling where Madame Arbo and myself were dissenting about the right to life and the right to kind of economic rights, but we were in the same. Um, eventually, um, I am sure that the whole notion of human rights will evolve, even in, Ca in Canada here, to include more and more of those types of rights. But it, it is not in our, in our constitution, actually. And so we'll see how it evolves. It can, I don't think it can go back that, uh, to the Dark Ages. I think we can hope only that we develop that conscience about uh, the necessity to guarantee uh, to people that they can live decently. And they have, um, it's not so much capitalism. You, you, uh, capitalism depends on the definition yet, but, but Canada is particularly can, capitalist socialist. We have heavy taxes. We give, uh, you know, we have the basic uh, subsistence for people. So, you know, com by comparison, by other Democratic, countries, yeah. you know, uh, uh, universal health care, for example. But I think um, the, the notion of capitalism, of socialism, and everything is a, is a very uh, tough question. Uh, if people, they have tried it in the communist country that people would be equal, and nobody will earn anything. So what does it give them? Uh, what has it given to people? They rejected it, so there has to be a system that can that can um, uh, uh, have the two objectives together. People have to have have uh, uh, jobs in order to survive, and the capital. Bill Gates just made a big uh, declaration at Davos today or yesterday about the fact that uh, the, the rich people should give the money uh, to uh, to um, uh, permit society to, to society. So there is, there are, there will be ideas that will eventually. Uh, you have to be hopeful. What about if you're not hopeful? What nobody will get up and and try to fight for those rights. We have to fight. We've had to fight since the, since the times immemorial. So I think it's. Uh, I agree uh, with that. I'm not. I'm not uh, going here to say capitalism is bad. No, because what what you what you um, what is the notion of capital is a whole debate in itself. Uh, so I think Canada has a certain measure of uh, socialism enough because uh, I think we are one of the countries where the taxes are, are most, uh, the greatest to uh, give some sort of um, uh, health care is, is one aspect that you cannot neglect on that. Eh? Uh, yeah, it's a pretty this is a, a very interesting issue of the intersection and limitations of law uh, in the context of economic and political realities. That's correct. And it, it, it relates again to, uh, to one of the points uh, Madam Justice Zero Debay made that the, the responsibility to press an agenda of human rights and creating a culture of rights which allows people to live with dignity. Uh, is something which you cannot leave to the judges, even as distinguished and as uh, elegant and eloquent judges, Madam Justice Sarah it's a, it's a It's a responsibility of all of us in every way we can to push that agenda and make our voices heard and, and not think that judges alone or politicians alone will bring about the, uh, the, the result in which we can all stand together and, and be proud of, of who we are and and how we, we live with dignity. 